Um, thanks a million for inviting me here today. Um, and particularly, it's nice and it's really, really positive to be uh, moving from critical dual diagnosis to positive dual recovery, because for so many years, we've been saying how shy things are, and we keep replicating how things are not working, how this is not happening, yet we know what we're supposed to do for the future. Uh, and we're moving into the language and the actions of doing dual recovery and finally doing what we already know we need to do. So I think that's great that we're working on this positive note. Um, I suppose the first thing, though, before we go anywhere is when you put dual diagnosis and, and even by association, dual recovery up there, um, we're immediately going into a mythical domain um, because whilst dual diagnosis is a term and it's used in policy, it's used in services, it's used politically um, and possibly for good reason politically, it's singularly unhelpful for people who are looking uh, for help in relation to dual diagnosis. And it's also quite stigmatizing, it's quite discriminatory, um, and it can be quite divisive, because as long as you start kind of separating pieces of people's uh, personal experience and transferring into service delivery and into policy into other areas, it allows people, services, and politics to be div divisive. Um, so I just kind of want to put it out there from the outset that the research is showing that as soon as you engage people, and this is people who might be using services, family members, community members, the term dual diagnosis is neither helpful nor relevant to their complex needs or to what they're hoping to receive. That might seem quite surprising, considering that the title of this conference is, is kind of dual diagnosis, the dual recovery. Um, we have a new model coming out around dual diagnosis. For a lot of people who are trying to change the world um, around dual diagnosis, they do use it purposely, politically, uh, so that it doesn't continue to be swept under the carpet. Uh, but in the absolute awareness that it's not particularly helpful for people. You cannot separate the experience of people, the complex experience of people who are using substances, who've got mental health difficulties and all sorts of other kind of um, adversity in their lives. And to do so is invalidating their total experience. And um, by association, dual recovery needs to be carefully looked at. Because if we're moving from the problems of I can't do that, I can only do this into dual recovery, we also need to be quite careful about um, maintaining separateness. Because if you maintain separateness, dual recovery will, 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 will not occur. So the notion of dual recovery is, by the same token, not necessarily not necessarily um, separate entities and not necessarily something that's going to be useful for people who are experiencing what I'll still call dual diagnosis for now um, because it means that I may be continue to be changed from pillar to post. So it's just putting that up there as a caveat. You know, politically, dual recovery is very, very relevant and very, very necessary um, as long as it's seen systemically. Um, and as long as it's not seen in the way that dual diagnosis used to be and still is seen within the medical perspective, um, but not within a community uh, perspective. So rather than a dual recovery, I think what we look at now in the research and in good practice is a systemic response. Um, a systemic response to, uh, to all sorts of complex needs because I, 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 and, and people who are coming at the end of the at the end of, of this session uh, with personal experience will, will, will either um, tell me I'm right or wrong, but it's, there's no such thing as just coming to the table with, uh, you know, a substance use issue or with a mental health issue or, or other, you know, addictive kind of features in the life. There's usually all sorts of other factors in people's lives um, that combine to create a complex need. Um, um, you know, not least poverty or homelessness or other physical issues or traumas in people's lives. So a systemic response is dual recovery. Um, 
Um, and that's in the literature on dual diagnosis, in the literature uh, and in all the research and all the good practice in relation to uh, working with people with complex needs. Um, so by definition, it requires more than one agency. Um, so one of the things, and we'll see it later on in this in this kind of session, is we have to move from the notion of one-stop shop, and some people won't necessarily agree with that, uh, where you know somebody deals with a piece of a person, somebody else deals with another piece of a person. It's the integration of agency working that works. And those of you who are already here and already doing really good stuff have seen that happen in your own communities. And I'll give one or two examples as we as we move along. Um, uh, so, you know, I've already said, I suppose, a piece that you can't separate by category um, what's going on in somebody's head and somebody's life and somebody's body and somebody's experience. I'm only going to focus on five major concepts that's coming from all of the national. So we've quite a lot of national research in dual diagnosis now. So we've got an Irish context not just an international context and interestingly they actually tally quite nicely the, the, the main difference in the Irish context uh, that jumps out much more than some of the other international literature is the requirement of community connection which is lovely to see that that's kind of an extra piece in the Irish literature so we we'll focus on five concepts that enables dual recovery or systemic response I'm not going to focus much on the medical aspect here, uh, and it might be that David does when, when, when he comes on, but medicine already has a strong voice in, in, in uh, dual diagnosis, and, and Anita will probably talk about this later in terms of, in relation to specialist services, medicine will prevail in terms of the, the dual diagnosis perspective. Um, what I'm talking about is for everybody with not dual diagnosis, not just the people that need kind of careful monitoring of kind of interactive uh, medication etc etc um so one of the things that's kind of i suppose very relevant in the past and we need to avoid it in the future instead of having venus and mars we need to converge um and in order to converge we literally have to shift the way we look at things so we created we created a system before, which I won't go back to, that's kept everything separate and created gaps um and in order for us to undo that um, uh, kind of change, we need to consider dual diagnosis differently. It's not addiction and our mental health. It's not necessarily a medical condition. Um, it's not necessarily something that's brought about from a particular kind of chemical diagnosis. We need to look at it in a multi, in a kind of a multi way where it's not just a medical problem. It's not just a disorder. It's not just a disease. It's part. It's part of a life. It comes about as a result of, of a challenging life. Because if we don't change the way we look at things uh, and continue to look at things the way it was done before will just perpetuate the problem that caused issues in the first place. That's really, really important. We've seen in the communities, not necessarily in statutory services yet, where people are looking at things differently and they are really, really pushing the boat. The, the push for the change in, in dual recovery is coming from the community, not from statutory services. And, and that's, that's very, very relevant, although statutory services are being given a very specific remit in this. Um, so what's a cultural shift in how we view dual diagnosis and how it has responded to. So interestingly, the dual recovery is not about using different medications. It's not about becoming kind of a specialist kind of dual diagnosis trained worker, although that could help. It's a cultural shift. And some of the ways we kind of move into that cultural shift is policy change. Well, hey, we've had policy change. So the first cultural shift, our capacity for cultural shift has now happened. And that will be spoken to in, in, in the next session. Um, particularly, we need to end the dichotomous. That's a big word. I just like it. But basically, the turf wars that split people um, and territorial positioning. It's interesting when, when I'm already, I work quite a lot in communities around the country that's trying to to address dual diagnosis and one of the things we sometimes notice is the territorial positioning in the response to dual diagnosis is repeating the same kind of positioning that causes the problem in responding to dual diagnosis. This is sometimes an unconscious thing, it's a systemic thing, uh, and it's where people haven't managed to shift their position. So even in the 
resolution, people are staying in that position. So the response is to change their territorial position and to kind of work um, bilaterally instead of actually trying to hold on to turf as people have and continue to have been doing. Um, and we're seeing some of that change, not yet at the, uh, um, at the statutory level, but within the community level, people are, are much more integrating. The education of philosophy, once that changes, the culture begins to change. So when you have a psychiatrist and nurses and psychologists and community workers and social workers and people will experience in the same room being educated together and learning from each other then you don't have the narrow views that most professions have so you don't have a narrow medical view or a purely social view or a purely experiential view and where that's been shown in other uh, jurisdictions the interdisciplinary and the intercommunity training we unlearn the stuff that caused the problems of dual diagnosis and relearn the way of doing it better. So it's, it's quite simple, but it requires uh, people from the various territories um, to make a decision to kind of combine education. Uh, and also to cross fertilization of professional academic perspectives. So I really like to hear about medical perspectives, for example, on dual diagnosis, because it helps me understand some of the issues around pharm pharmacy interventions and that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm more interested in people's experiences of services um, and even more interest in, for example, looking at um, dual diagnosis through the lens of trauma informed community, because what we're finding in the literature should have to respond to dual diagnosis effectively, we need to respond to traumatized systems. Um, but once we cross fertilize all that, there's a kind of a, a big learning for all of us in it. <clears throat> Practice change in all organizations. So the notion that I can't treat an addiction in mental health services, uh, the notion that I'm not able to deal with psychosis and addiction service, um, all of this needs to move. I'm going to give one example. Um, it comes across all the time and it's it's an individual we've all I work in mental health services um, um, as well as, as kind of other roles um, we've all been socialized through our cultures uh, into thinking that there's parts of dual diagnosis we can't deal with now, I've never met anybody with a dual diagnosis who said, no, you, you couldn't deal with me and, and you couldn't deal with me. I've met people who says, well, you're not helping me. You're not able to help me. Not that you can't deal with me. But it's a myth that any professional in either addiction, mental health or community services are unable to work with someone with dual diagnosis. And it's a myth that, 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 uh, that's been perpetuated through our training, through our education and through our culture. So there's no way if somebody's in distress, if I'm a counsellor, if I'm a peer worker, if I'm a recovery coach, if I'm a psychiatrist, a nurse, a, 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 psych, a psychologist, social worker, I cannot work with that person. That's actually a myth. What may be necessary is I need other agency infrastructure. When somebody comes along and says to me, I feel like killing myself, it doesn't matter where I work, who I am, what I am. It's about I, you, how I humanly interact with somebody. If somebody comes along to me and says, I'm out of control, I can't do this anymore. It makes no difference whether you're in a mental health service, a homeless service, a hostel and addiction service. That professional can uh, uh, respond if they choose to respond. And that's even without extra special dual diagnosis training. And that, that's really, really necessary in this dual response. Now there's more to it than that, but that's the first line. Um, it is a myth that we don't and can't. And it's often a cop-out uh, and not just an individual cop-out. We've been told that it's an unconscious cop-out and it's an organizational cop-out. Um, so practice change is relevant. Uh, however, um, uh, don't underestimate the capacity of people in any of your organizations to be able to respond. I've kind of already said we need to understand the complex needs to the large larger social lens so for example social determinants you know we if we concentrate on disease we forget about poverty we forget about um you know disjointed families we forget about homes we forget about all of the things that contribute to people um coping with a life um uh, of struggle and, and oftentimes through substance use through addictive behavior through uh, developing mental health coping mechanisms and I suppose um, one of the things, I'll go back to education for a second. Um, 
So one of the one of the issues that we're resolving, uh, and I won't talk about the whole training and that, training analysis that that will come after. One of the things that we're resolving uh, with an individual response is the, the cultural change through the educational lens and through the practice change will address what is sometimes happening in the past. And we're going to talk about the past because we're now in the response, where, for example, in an addiction service or in some community projects, I'm reluctant to be able to engage with somebody, for example, who's got a diagnosis of schizophrenia, because I think a diagnosis of schizophrenia makes them very, very psychotic and they've got strange thoughts and they hear voices. However, when across the board, we look at a lens of be it somebody diagnosed with schizophrenia or somebody diagnosed as an addict uh, or with a substance use disorder. When we look at it in a wider lens, we don't see that person as a kind of a psychiatric diagnosed person. We see it as somebody in life who's responding differently because of the life circumstances. That means that if I can help somebody make sense of their voices, as opposed to try and work out what the hell I do with somebody with schizophrenia, that I'm able to help that person, whether I'm in mental health service or addiction service or the community. But in order to be able to see that and do that, I have to have looked at things differently. And I also do need some under, uh, uh, some at least awareness around kind of uh, the, the wider lens of, of, of dual diagnosis or, or, or complex need. And, and the same, same in mental health. So the opposite of mental health is where I'm not supposed to deal with somebody who's actively using substances, because unless they stop doing that, they're not going to get better. Um, now, uh, that's also crap, um, but that's the way I've been trained uh, within mental health service. It's not my fault. Um, and acculturated. So in mental health, what I need to do as part of the dual response is to work in a more harm reductionist uh, kind of approach, as opposed to a kind of a, an abstinence approach or a need or our approach. And once those kind of cultural shifts begin to happen across the board and throughout the community, through two tiers of education, uh, awareness across the community for everybody in the community, and then maybe this wider kind of uh, dilution of a kind of a, a narrow view of how you deal with addiction or with mental health, then that cultural shift begins to happen. And then no matter where I am based in the community or in service provision, I can respond. So that's that kind of personal organization ability to deal with dual diagnosis. Um, so integrated care, the interconnected services. So all of the the research, and, and this is no surprise to anybody because we know this in our gut, never mind what the research says, that we need interconnected services. And when we have integrated care, um, now all of the things that will be thrown up to stop this are the problems of the past. So all of the things that are thrown to stop this are GDPR and we can't share notes and we can't share this and we can't share, all of that by the by, if that is real, um, doesn't, um, doesn't stop us from having integrated care because there's ways of having integrated care. For example, I'm going to go there for the end. We have case management, our dual diagnosis coordination. We can integrate care through that process. Um, uh, if we have kind of an awareness across the board between the agencies, if we've mapped out within our kind of catchment area, so for example, in kind of Clondalkin community, what people do in relation to dual diagnosis, um, we can integrate that without by without kind of crossing the GDPR issues, without even necessarily doing the shared notes. It's not about the shared notes. The people who have dual diagnosis don't really give a shit about the notes. What they care about is actually getting their needs met. So that's the most important thing um, for them. And sometimes it's us professionals that care about the notes more than the actual interaction. Um, there is, of course, a requirement, but in, in other jurisdictions, and indeed in some places in Ireland, we meet the notes requirement without it taking over our lives. So integrated care is is possible and is happening in certain places around the country. Cross referral, again, quite easily done as long as you don't get caught up in the whole bureaucracy about cross referral. A cross referral, if I'm a, a dual diagnosis coordinator and working with a person with dual diagnosis, is certain, certainly me ringing up Peter and saying, hey, it's Paul. Um, 
There's uh, somebody I'm working at the moment that really needs to, um, it really needs to be seen kind of over the next 24 hours in order to kind of be taken off the streets because they're in a crisis position. Is there anything you can do for me? Um, yes, of course, because we're already working in integrated care. Some of you have experienced this and it's often down to personality as opposed to services. So we need to move from personalities who can do this kind of cross referral to services that can do it. And again, it is happening and it has happening throughout the country where people have developed dual diagnosis services. And this is despite despite um, kind of attempts um, for these services to be stopped because they don't meet with the normal kind of uh, statutory uh, way of doing work. They need to be trauma and multi-perspective informed. What I mean by that is if we continue with the medical kind of way of thinking about dual diagnosis, then we continue to separate people's experiences and we continue to separate the possibility of treatment. So we need to look at a wider perspective. That doesn't mean if I'm, if I'm a psychiatrist, I can't look at it with a medical perspective, particularly if I'm looking at the interaction of drugs. I need to look at it as a medical perspective. That, doesn't, that also means that if I'm working in a community, I need to look at it in a wider perspective. If if I'm actually working or trying to meet kind of the broad needs of somebody, I need to see those needs through a social determinants of health perspective. So a social model uh, of kind of health and care, because if we don't see it in the multi perspective, then we end up, we will end up perpetuating the previous status quo. So that, that becomes quite important in this dual response. That's that multi way of looking at things. And, and um, interestingly, if we can look at it, from the initial perspective of the person who's actually come to the door, no matter what door they come to, that will help us widen how we need to be able to look at it. Because you might not come to the door with a kind of a massive trauma in your background. You might come to the door uh, with something that's kind of socially determined uh, through kind of a lifestyle that you've had, through the kind of life that you've led. And then as long as I can look at that and not say, oh, I'm just gonna look at this addiction and this mental illness, then there's the possible for the dual response. Um, relational and knowing and engagement. What do I mean by that? Um, I'm just, I can't actually see the chat. So if any chat comes in, the way I'm sharing, I can't see the chat. If any chat comes in, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll pick up on it afterwards. Um, okay. So I was saying that something that's, it's not new internationally, but it's particularly strong in all of the research done in Ireland, that in order for people with the complex needs associated with the combination of mental health problems uh, and, and substance use problems, and I keep saying mental health and substance use problems because the way things are going forward, dual diagnosis is, is particularly looking at this. Now, anybody around the table knows that kind of, you know, substance use and kind of addictive behaviors are much more than just substance use. You know, there's, there's gambling, there's smoking, there's sex, there's lots of others as well. But I'm referring to this because that's the principal way the policy is addressing dual diagnosis. But I'm very conscious it's much broader um, than, than these two kind of concepts. But within the research, the community connection is key, um, particularly if you think about the dual stigma associated with having substance use issues and mental health issues. So you're stigmatized by your community, by your family, uh, by education, um, and, and more so by services who are supposed to be there to help you. They're, 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 they're stigmatize you also and discriminate against you. Um, so for any services, moving forward with dual diagnosis is about community reconnection. So we already know that community projects are in a perfect uh, position to do this. Uh, but at the moment, mental health uh, and to a lesser extent, addiction services statutory uh, are not as adept at the community connection and reconnection. Um, in mental health, for example, often we maintain people in the mental health bubble rather than enable recovery and reconnection to the community. In addiction services, often the book stops with, well, what treatment services they attend necessarily than engaging kind of beyond the kind of bubble of addiction and beyond the kind of maintenance kind of of people in, 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 in a space of addiction. So, uh, the, so far the community projects are the ones that actually are kind of bringing that further forward. But going forward, Forward, both statutory addiction and mental health services need to be able to do this as part of a dual diagnosis response. We need to remove them from those bubbles. That's the that, that's that's the answer to recovery. Maintenance you can maintain in the bubble, but uh, recovery, and this is what the conference is about, is actually removing and doing whatever we can on that healing journey for people to move away from the bubble that we've been able to provide for part of people's lives. 
family support, and this is contentious, particularly in mental health services, even though we've got multiple policies, multiple standards around family support. You know, we're not about the family, we're about the service user. Well, actually, we're about all. If we're thinking about this systemically, you can't separate family from service user. Even if that service user hasn't seen their family for 100 years, they're systemically connected to the family in some form or fashion. And our significant others, who has become their tribe, who has become their family, is as relevant. And without that family, our tribe, our significant other support, the person and system does not recover. Peer support, it's relevant throughout all sorts of interactions, but we know now for sure in dual diagnosis in this kind of complex needs that peer support is fundamental um, to people's ability to recover. And it's great that we see this, uh, you know, these are two of the, the interesting advances in both mental health and, and substance use kind of uh, worlds over the past few years to, to kind of... The, um, the recovery coaches kind of through the addiction field and the peer support workers in the mental health field. That's one of the most radical and beneficial responses so far within both communities because it's a necessarily, um, not conditional, it's absolutely necessarily uh, a way of engaging with people uh, in order to enable dual, dual, um, uh, dual recovery. Community embedded in service provision. Well, that kind of links up to the first point. Um, you know, we will have specialist service provision, and we'll probably hear about that um, uh, uh, later on. But community embedded service provision is what enables um, recovery. 85% um, of people with dual diagnosis will be um, needing to, looking to um, recover within their own communities um, and within the supports that their own communities can provide and be trying to uh, look at the services within the community that can help them uh, with that. Can people still hear me? I just lost my ears. <laughs> just thumbs up. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I can hear you. Then. Thanks. thanks, Trevor. Um, I'll stop moving around in my chair. Um, so, um, so a lot of you are saying, well, that's grand. We're already in the community. And I, I often hear my mental health and, and kind of addiction colleagues and other colleagues here saying, yeah, we're in the community. We're community uh, services. And, and then you begin to actually talk about, but are you community embedded? Are you community connected? Are you about the community uh, and uh, part of the community? Are you a community provision? You know, so there's quite a kind of, and sometimes it's, it's not just playing with language. I often hear people say, yeah, of course we're the community, but they're not. They're about the bubble and they just happen to have moved the bubble wider into the community. In my language and in my kind of area, we often talk about moving out of the mental health institutions into the community, which has now become institutions without walls, which means we didn't necessarily move into the community. We just just kind of moved our position and, and and i've seen the same in addiction service as well i, I can just speak more kind of closely to to my own practice uh, normal practice arena um the other thing is uh, if we work systemically and if we change our practice culture uh and if we are open as kind of unknowing uh just knowing that in a, i'm in a position to be able to support as either an organization or as a person then i'm in a position to be able to respond to individuals theory of change so what i mean by that is what's happened to that person to bring them to you to bring them to the place they're at and what do they feel or what do they think at this moment in time they can do to move along their journey now that's easy for some people to kind of uh, respond to right now and a lot of people in this kind of meeting can say yeah that's what i do but it's not so easy for everybody it's not so easy for some services that are for a particular because services are not generally based on need they're based on what they were funded to do they're based on what they're resourced to do and they're based on the type of culture and training involved in them so but if we can move to a place and as some people are working with people's theory of change, then we have the capacity to start that dual recovery process. And that's easier said than done. And some of the things that already spoken to in terms of relational knowing and in terms of how we look at things differently will enable us to do that. The key um, 
to be able to deal with some of the things like integrated care, referral, the different agencies, when we have people who have got at least significant mental health, uh, mental health uh, problems and dual diagnosis problems and other kind of complex problems associated with their life or lifestyle, um, is somewhere or someplace having a responsible kind of spot, uh, person, discipline or service who will carry out the case management or kind of dual diagnosis coordination. This is best practice world over. Um, and it's not just about in specialist services. It's, it's, in, it's, it's, it's regardless. There needs to be a kind of a place. So rather than a one-stop shop, there needs to be a place where people can arrive and where the coordination and the case management is possible. This is the piece that kind of over, this is the piece that counters the kind of, no, that's not our job. No, that's not our job. This is the place that counters some services not knowing where there's someplace useful as uh, that could be found elsewhere. This is the place where all of the available agencies and services in the communities can be accessed because there's a kind of a vortex here where people are uh, who are in a role of case management or dual diagnosis know what's going on knows the links to different services different agencies and is able to be that one kind of person or that one agency where the person or family connected to the person with dual diagnosis can go to as as they're kind of consistent and the requirement is consistent because we all know that in the past the lack of consistent and the kind of the fragmentation and the chaos of people's lives is part and parcel of the reason why they fall through all sorts of gaps so the consistent case management of dual diagnosis and i know we're going to hear later about case management um you know at a kind of a specialist level but the case management at at any level and the community level is where dual diagnosis will uh dual sorry not dual diagnosis where dual recovery and systemic recovery will be enabled. And we've seen this example in lots of places. We've seen it in Cork, we've seen it uh, in, in Tipperary. We, we've seen it in lots of services who have tried to address dual diagnosis before the government has even given permission to do that. We've seen it in, in Northeast inner city Dublin where, where people have started to do this case management and be able to link it to all the available other project services as well. Uh, you, you may even have it in Clondalkin as well, but there's a couple of services working like that. So the, the, we know it works, not only from the research, we know it works works from good practice elsewhere in other jurisdictions and where we've seen it happening within the Irish context as well. Um, integrated care pathways, I suppose, similar to that notion of interconnected agencies and interconnected care pathways probably can only be enabled by two things. One, by having that notion of dual diagnosis coordinator or, or case manager. And the language is it's kind of different language for the same thing, really. I'm sure they've got all their different ideologies, but I use dual diagnosis coordinator because that's the one that, that's tied in with best practice within the kind of dual diagnosis international literature. But case management does the same thing. Um, the, uh, the, having that allows for integrated care pathways. Having the interconnected services allows for integrated integrated care pathways, and having a systemic view and an unlearning of previous cultural views allows for integrated care pathways. People give all sorts of reasons why they can't happen. The only reason they can't happen is because of previous unmoving cultures, uh, not necessarily conscious, often unconscious because the way I'm trained, the way I've been socialized, the way my organization tells me I can do things. And often kind of GDPR is not necessarily something GDPR is often used as resistance to avoid doing things. Um, and I'm not dishing GDPR. It's so important because it's people's kind of that, it's information about people, but it's often used as a way to avoid actually moving forward. Um, and as I said earlier on, it doesn't have to be an issue for interconnected services or for integrated care pathways. There's several, several programs that have are underway in terms of integrating care pathways. I I I think. Uh, and we'll hear more about that, um, that part of the dual diagnosis model is going to have this as part of what happens. Um, but certainly where I've seen it work um, without breaching GTPR and without having to have all sorts of memorandums of understanding, et cetera, it enables, there's no such thing as a seamless route through dual diagnosis 
it's complex people have challenging lives doesn't mean their lives are going to be suddenly perfect at the end of all this um it's a healing journey that might go on for a long 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 time uh, or it might actually go on for a shorter time but with the five concepts that have been kind of discussed here and as part of the dual response or systemic response it means that healing and recovery is possible as opposed to uh maintenance or as opposed to a continuous perpetuation of the life that people have led and that's been perpetuated by previous services whoops i just kind of said that one of the unfortunate things is that sometimes there is a paradigm shift we don't necessarily see it kind of in our own back garden but that move has started we have started to move into a dual diagnosis space, a dual recovery space, should I say, in a lot of services. It's also in small places. And this webinar is a perfect example of that. Uh, and we've seen it elsewhere across the country, and particularly across pockets of Dublin. That paradigm shift has happened. And now policy is allowing the paradigm shift to happen. Um, often in other jurisdictions, the cart had to come before the horse. People had to start doing the good practice. People had to start just getting in, getting on with it. And that government, when they realized things were happening and the impacts were happening, suddenly thought, oh, shit, we better get into this as well, because we're supposed to be delivering this in the first place. Um, our government is beginning to do that. It's way behind. Um, the communities are doing it. Individual practitioners, individual community people and services are doing it. So it is actually happening. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs>